This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Danny Berger and Kriti Gupta. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York, and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. Wall Street banks brace for tougher rules from U.S. regulators next week that go beyond global standards. Morgan Stanley and Bank of America are set to report results today. Details emerge on the U.S. crackdown on China tech investments. The curves will be targeted and likely won't go into effect until next year. And Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says China's economic slowdown risk causing ripple effects across the globe, but she doesn't expect a U.S. recession. Bloomberg is live in India as G20 finance chiefs conclude a two-day meeting. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. Kriti Gupta is in New York. Kriti, team soft landing really seems to be picking up some more players. You have Jan Hatsis and the Bank of America survey just had in a majority of investors say they think a soft landing is coming. Yeah, that Goldman call, I think, really changing a little bit of the market perspective, giving some weight to the folks who are saying, maybe we can just navigate this all right. And I think bank earnings have a lot to do with it. The messages we got last Friday out of J.P. Morgan and uh, the other banks really helped with that narrative, saying, look, consumers are doing just fine. Take a look at the credit card numbers. Take a look at loan loss provisions. The numbers are coming out just great. The question is, does that stand in today's bank earnings story as well? We've got Morgan Stanley coming out among a slew of others as well. Take a look at features, though. It feels like that's really where we're waiting for what those bank results are going to tell us to perhaps give that Jan Hot CS at Goldman call a little more momentum when it comes to the soft landing. What gets interesting to me, Danny, though, is that the bond market might just be on a different page. 469 on the front end of the curve, already seeing a pullback, again, at 5 a.m. New York time of about five basis points. That is a big deal when you're talking about the moves in pre-market trading. It also makes sense as we talk about a repricing. Remember, in addition to that soft landing narrative, more and more folks are coming out of the woodwork and saying maybe those cut expectations, maybe they're not going to come immediately in 2023, but they might just come in 2024. And that's an interesting kind of realm where you are seeing a little bit of uh, momentum, if you will. As we look at the yield story, we have to look at the FX story as well. The dollar actually weaker against a, a slew of currencies, but the Korean won seeing the biggest move against the dollar. You are seeing the dollar weaker about five tenths of one percent against that currency. What's interesting to me, though, is that over Overnight, you also saw the uh, Samsung, the, com- the Cosby index that has Samsung is about 33% of its weighting also sell off in a really big way. It tells you chips are part of the narrative, at least when it comes to the overnight trade. We're going to connect the dots for you later on in the show. And of course, always a check on the commodity space. NYMEX crew trading at a 74 handle, Danny. Pretty, let me give you a check on Europe because European equities are gaining this morning after an ugly day yesterday, really spurred by China. So we haven't made up for those losses, but we're on our way to do so. The overall index up about two tenths of one percent. Leading the way is Ocado, the online grocer, turning their Marks and Spencer's JV profitable. So that got investors excited. They'd be able to keep costs in. But really, I think the interesting thing on here is the CEO and speaking to reporters saying that UK food inflation is on its way down and has peaked. There's some macro data to back that up, too. That was out early this morning. The other big European mover is what we got out of the G20 meeting. Bloomberg was speaking with Klaus Kanat, who had a more optimistic view of inflation's ability to come back in. It's similarly what Viscos from the Bank of Italy said, too. So those more confident voices about inflation has spurred a really big rally. Shafts leading the way here. Two-year yields down nearly 10 basis points. And the strength we saw in the euro is pairing because of that. It is still, though, stronger versus the dollar. Pretty That is its ninth day of strengthening versus is the greenback, which is its longest winning streak, should it hold since 2004. Yeah, it's interesting. This interest rate differential is kicking in as we talk about what the central banks are repricing. But that's just one part of the story, Dan- Danny. We go from central banks to Wall Street banks as well. U.S. bank regulators poised to release plans for a sweeping overhaul of capital rules next week. Bloomberg reporting the changes would include requirements for large lenders, residential mortgages that would go beyond global standards. For more on this Bloomberg scoop, we're joined by finance editor Tom Metcalf. Tom, Walk us through the story. The focus on residential mortgages is very specific. Yeah, exactly. And, and that's really what's new today. So, you know, these Basel III um, regulations have been sort of known about. They're coming into effect effectively. You know, the last couple of years, they've been basically in negotiations about them. What's coming through today is actually there's going to be this laser focus on residential mortgages. That's, of course, going to be a particular sort of interest or impact for banks like the cities, the Wells Fargo. And the reason why is, I guess it's where the regulators see probably the most risk. You know, they're trying to make sure the kind of 
banking system is, is insulated against any you know, downdraft in that market. But of course, for the banks, that's a really big business and you know, extra regulatory requirements around that will hit their bottom line. We're also going to get more bank earnings today. We have some regional banks. There's Morgan Stanley, Bank of America. What are you looking out for, Tom? Yeah, definitely Bank of America and Morgan Stanley will be fascinating. You know, how does Bank of America do more on that retail banking side? And then for Morgan Stanley, obviously, almost now more of a wealth manager, right? So how they do, and, and that sets us up nicely as well for Goldman earnings tomorrow. Yeah, certainly. Looking forward to those ones. Tom, thank you very much for setting it up. As always, Bloomberg's Tom Metcalf. And speaking of which, coming up later today, Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman, following the bank's second quarter earnings report, will be speaking to Bloomberg. That's at 1.30 p.m. New York time, 6.30 p.m. if you are here in London. To the world of tech, the Biden administration's plan to restrict investments in China will be narrowly focused on cutting-edge technology, only new investments and likely won't go effect until next year. Joining us now on this is Bloomberg Asia government and politics correspondent Rebecca Chung Wilkins. Rebecca, I mean, these plans sound paired back from what we had heard earlier. Yeah, it's interesting. They do. They, there was some sort of speculation that they might include things like biotech or energy, but actually these really seem to be characterized by being targeted and also by being slow. So the emphasis here is the investment restrictions that would be screened or potentially entirely prohibited, but limited to areas of national security, so artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and semiconductors. So that's somewhat narrower than uh, some were expecting and certainly that Hawks on the Hill were hoping for. The emphasis also is in quite a slow rollout. It looks like officials are uh, aiming to have a proposal together by the end of August, but we wouldn't see enforcement until early next year. And the, we'd really only see enforcement uh, going forward. So nothing retroactive, which again, may be a little bit of comfort uh, to companies too. It does look like we have been waiting for these plans for quite a long time. And it does look like the Biden administration is really trying to take their time to work this out and avoid any inadvertent consequences, in part because this is something that really hasn't been tried before at this scale, something that could affect tens of billions, potentially even trillions of dollars of investments here. I mean, speaking of trying to avoid some sort of bigger fallout, it's interesting that the White House and perhaps the corporate uh, side are on two very different pages. U.S. chip makers, for example, meeting at the White House yesterday, perhaps trying to lobby for easier regulation. Walk us through that, Rebecca. How are they kind of approaching this issue? Yeah, we did have CEOs uh, from across the semiconductor industry, but including NVIDIA, Qualcomm, Intel, making their way to the White House. It was also a sit down with uh, Jake Sullivan, the national security advisor, too. again, stressing this emphasis that is not sort of widespread economic uh, policy, but something that's targeted and focused on trying to help U.S. national security. Now, they are obviously deeply concerned, U.S. Uh, tech uh, CEOs, deeply concerned about the impact, essentially, that this idea that if you restrict uh, U.S. Uh, chip makers uh, from the access to their largest industry, from their access to China, that will really hurt their revenues. Qualcomm, for example, depends on about 60% of its revenue comes from China. It's worth mentioning, too, that some of the representatives from those same firms were actually in Beijing last week, also speaking with top officials. And Beijing's line on de-risking, decoupling so far has actually been to try and uh, suggest that companies themselves, U.S. and foreign companies, themselves should be the ones to define de-risking, should be the ones to define where they want to diversify and pull back, rather than this being something that governments push for. Yeah, a lot to dissect. The Rebecca Chung Wilkins all over it for us. We thank you, as always, for joining the program this morning. Let's turn to the G20 meeting in India, where China, of course, has been the focus. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says Beijing has failed to address the unfair trade practices that led to Washington imposing tariff hikes on the country. Mm -hmm. We're undergoing a four-year required review of tariffs. We have to see what comes out of the four-year review. But I would emphasize um, that really the underlying concerns we have have not yet been addressed, and we need to work on that going forward. Janet Yellen there speaking exclusively to Bloomberg Television. For more, we're joined from New Delhi by Menka Doshi at the G20 meeting there. Menka, what have we been hearing about the U.S.-China relations specifically? Walk us through the kind of rhetoric there. 
Well, uh, we've had a, a range of comments come in from U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen in the week that she's been here in Gujarat, in Gandhinagar, where the G20 meeting of finance ministers and central bank governors is underway and on its last day. Uh, and we've had heard the Treasury Secretary just moments ago talk about that four-year review where the U.S. has not seen any change in China's trade practices to consider lifting any of those tariffs. The U.S. is also imposing restrictions on certain outbound investment into China. Uh, again, uh, you know, uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen saying that these are narrowly focused and they're unlikely to impact uh, the Chinese economy or investment uh, in China in any substantive way. And finally, she also did comment on the very tepid recovery in China uh, and the impact that would have on the global economy, saying there would be spillovers, but it's unlikely to prompt a recession in the U.S. The Treasury Secretary there walking a fine balance uh, between making sure that the economic relationship with China continues continues whilst raising all the issues that the U.S. has had differences on over the past several years. Manika, there's been just such a wide range of conversations from ECB policymakers who have sounded more dovish. That's been fueling a bond market rally to EM debt relief, too. What has materialized specifically on that point of emerging market debt relief in the meetings? Well, you have to know that these are baby steps. These G20 meetings don't necessarily always result in very big, uh, you know, quantum jumps in policy making across the world and therefore big headlines. But it does seem that there has been progress made in the conversations that have taken place here over the last 48 hours in being able to extend in a speedier way debt relief to several low income countries. Now, uh, many of the G20 members here drawing some strength from the Zambia resolution, which was a default resolution, drawing some strength from that and hoping that, that now that that's out of the way, other countries can follow suit. Uh, in fact, we spoke with the South Africa finance minister who said just this, that he is glad to see more convergence in this meeting than he has seen in previous meetings. In this G20 meeting, unlike last year, uh, I mean, we are moving quite closer to each other on a number of topics. Among other things, for instance, the broadly general consensus on first tracking the debt relief program in terms of the uh, uh, carbon framework agreed in the G G20. Okay. That's the South Africa finance minister speaking with Bloomberg earlier today. By this evening, we should hopefully have some sort of statement of remarks, a summary in technical language, not a communique, of the outcomes of this G20 meeting. And then all the attention will shift to the leaders' summit in September. That's where you will probably see more concrete decisions being taken. Here's where all the fine print gets hammered out. With that, it's back to you from Gandhi Nagar in Gujarat. Manika, thank you so much. I also love that. A background noise of beautiful birds chirping and maybe even a, a, a car alarm in there. Bloomberg's <laughs> Manika Doshi doing it all, reporting from the G20 meeting in India. All right, coming up on this program, Aberdeen's James Athey is keeping his money in the bond market. It's been a good time to do that, considering the rally we've seen. We're going to catch up with him later this hour. And don't miss our exclusive interview with the European Commissioner for Financial Services. Plus, U.S. bank earnings continue with Bank of America and Morgan Stanley before the bell. We'll have more on that still ahead. This is Bloomberg. dovish talk in vogue among central bankers as markets see some signs of a reprieve in inflation. The latest Bank of America fund manager survey shows more and more investors are now betting on a soft landing relative to a hard landing that coming amid expectations that central banks are nearing the end of the rate hiking cycle around the world. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Ksenia Galushko from our equities team. Ksenia, what does this mean in terms of the read through for the equity market? If we're already seeing green on the screen before even uh, this kind of soft landing was really expected, does this just accelerate the momentum into equities? 
Well, it depends on how you position, right? Um, most investors uh, are already uh, quite into this rally this year, so this could signal some caution for the second half of the year, actually. But what is interesting from the Bank of America fund manager survey is that investors are getting slightly more optimistic on corporate profit growth and on the soft landing. At the same time, they're not expecting the first Fed rate cut until the second quarter of next year. So they actually pushed back the expectations from the first quarter of next year to the second quarter. So while we, they are expecting the soft landing and no recession, at the same time, the sentiment remains quite cautious. And investors overall in this major global fund manager survey, which mainly focuses on major big investors globally, it does show that investors continue to be underweight equities, although this is the smallest underweight this year so they are reducing their underweight slightly what about crowded positioning i know the survey typically asks about that too Yes, so crowded positions are quite interesting. So the biggest, biggest of them all is the uh, US, U.S. big tech stocks. And there's really no surprise there because, honestly, the biggest rally that we've seen in equities so far this year has been in the Nasdaq and U.S. big tech stocks. This is uh, creating some risks for positioning because if anything goes wrong for big tech stocks, especially as we approach this earnings season, if there's any disappointment in AI expectations from the likes of NVIDIA that have Powered this rally, we might see a sharp drawdown, especially in the Nasdaq, and especially since these big tech stocks have such a major weighting in the S&P 500. This could be quite risky for this rally that we've seen this year. All right, Ksenia, thank you very much. That is Bloomberg's Ksenia Galuchko. I want to bring us some breaking lines now on Deutsche Bank. Deutsche Bank is drawing some ECB scrutiny over their FX swap sales. They've been told to improve their oversight and checks. Now, these instructions from the ECB follow months of internal FX derivatives probes from Deutsche Bank. So the supervisory team saying improve your oversight, improve your checks when it comes to FX derivatives sales. Shares dropping now about four tenths of one percent. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Now to some UK stories that caught our eye this morning and grocery prices in this country, inflation to be specific, has dropped at its fastest pace since the peak in March. Price growth slowed 1.6 percent points in the four weeks ending on July 9th after falling for four consecutive months, according to Cantor. Critty, this news comes ahead of UK CPI tomorrow. So maybe some positivity, maybe some hopefulness that those prices will finally come in overall. Yeah, and of course we know that food, there isn't a ton of elasticity when it comes to kind of the economic spending that the average British consumer might have. But Danny, I have to say, when you put a look at this from a global perspective, perhaps, I've heard anecdotally that food and groceries are actually cheaper in the UK and Europe than in around the world. As an expat, your take on that. <laughs> it's true. It's absolutely true. But they are rising a fair amount. But whenever I go back to New York, I definitely get a sticker price shock and I forget how expensive things can really be. Um, not to mention, Critty, we broke the news yesterday of Russia pulling out of that grain pack. I mean, the reason food inflation was so bad in the UK was because of Ukrainian grain not being able to get to the rest of the world. So this could be another reason food inflation picks up yet again. Yeah, and I think what's interesting here is that when you talk about food inflation, it's not just about uh, the Ukrainian story because, of course, it is a major factor. But then you have the, the idea of, say, rice protectionism emerging in likes of India and Southeast Asia. You have the idea of uh, drought and weather conditions hurting the U.S. grain exports, which, of course, is also a major contributor to agricultural prices, not to mention things like cattle and, and livestock, for example. So there's a lot to digest when it comes to the world's food space. And, and I think even though we're talking about inflation increasing in the U.S. and the U.K. or decreasing now when it comes to the food prices, take a look at some of the emerging markets where food prices are still climbing. And that, of course, is something that you can't really skimp on. Yeah. And the weather is just atrocious. There's El Nino, there's heat waves going to make all of it worse. I think I saw a story, something like 
Tomato farmers in India were getting record prices. So at least for now, a, a good time to be a tomato farmer, apparently. <laughs> um, Kriti, another UK story that caught our eye. The number of Britons who would vote to remain in the EU if the Brexit referendum were to be held again is at its highest level, according to a U YouGov survey. 51% of respondents said they would vote to rejoin the bloc, while 32 would stay out. You know the best thing from this survey, though. You pointed this out, too. It's the entry of the Brexit lexicon, regret. Those who regret Brexit, 57%. Yeah, but let's talk about these numbers really quickly uh, before I crack up at the title of this chart. Uh, <laughs> the idea that, I mean, it, it looks from just simply the charts that this is increasing, but if you look at kind of the way these pollings uh, have, have come out, it doesn't show that much of a change when it comes to kind of the, the everyday talk and the everyday sentiment around Brexit. I, I wonder if there will ever be another opportunity to, to rejoin the EU in the future, but for now, I guess we'll have to do with this. Yeah, I mean, considering the elections we have coming up, um, it, look, likelihood talking to those uh, politicos who watch this stuff, something like 10 years if we do get another vote to rejoin. So yes, the sentiment might be changing, but the action will likely take some time to come. All right, coming up on this show, we're going to get back to the market story. We'll speak with Aberdeen's James Athey as European bonds rally off the back of an interview with Klaus Kanat. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Wall Street banks brace for tougher rules from U.S. regulators next week that go beyond global standards. Morgan Stanley and Bank of America are set to report results today amid others. Details emerge on the U.S. crackdown on China tech investments. The curves will be targeted and likely won't go into effect until next year. Meanwhile, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says China's economic slowdown risks causing ripple effects across the globe. But she doesn't expect a U.S. recession. Bloomberg is live in India as G20 finance chiefs conclude a two-day meeting. I'm Kriti Gupta in New York with Danny Berger in London. Danny, a lot to digest here, but the calls for a soft landing around the world, not just in the U.S., really picking up steam. Yeah, we heard from some ECB chiefs, which we'll get to in just a moment, talking about hopefulness over inflation coming down. And that has had an impact on the bond market. We're getting a bit in the front end of the German curve. All about shots this morning. Those yields down by about nine tenths of one percent. Euro, some of the strength there coming in because of that, Critty, uh, because of the buying we're seeing in the bond market, though it is still stronger for its ninth straight session, which would be the longest since 2004. Meanwhile, in equity land here in Europe, we're up by about a quarter of one percent it was a really ugly day yesterday luxury goods absolutely hammered over concern about china and richemont sales which showed a weaker american consumer but over here a lot about grocery prices we're just talking about this critty Acado had really solid earnings they're the online grocer they also sell a, a platform for automated grocery when it comes to warehouses one of their joint ventures with MS finally profitable but their ceo adding fuel to this disinflation fire at least for food in the uk saying that uk food prices have peaked and they're coming down critty i mean we just went into a whole thing about uk food prices but i gotta say <laughs> yeah, we don't someone, need you again <laughs> yeah i'll just say sitting as sitting in new york city not a fan of food prices what i will say is that the inflation story still is top of mind for equity uh, the equity futures not so much though you are seeing them unchanged a lot of that kind of cotton should ahead of those bank earnings remember they're just as important as perhaps monetary policy in terms of what we're seeing from the u.s consumer credit card spending loan loss provisions even trading volume talking about the bond volatility and we should go right there because you're already seeing that bond volatility take over in the pre-market session. Two-year yield here already down by about five basis points. It really tells you that concept of a soft landing, the commentary from the likes of Jan Hatzius over at Goldman Sachs, really moving the market this morning. 469 on the front end of the curve. You go further out to the 10-year, you are seeing the same thing, four or five basis point moves. You would think that as the yields come down, the dollar would come down with it. And it kind of has against some of the major currencies. Danny, you just walked us through some of the currency picture throughout the show. But overnight, the biggest control contributor to the Bloomberg dollar index was actually the Korean won. You saw a major sell off in those chip stocks, which affected the index, which also then affected the currency. Nevertheless, it's actually weighing on the dollar to the tune about five tenths of one percent. As we talk about inflation, though, we have to talk about recession odds. And with it, for that, we get our commodity check 74 handle Danny on NYMEX crude. 
still can't seem to break $80. Critty, to that ECB story, I teased it, so we got to talk about it. ECB Governing Council member Ignacio Viscos says that inflation may come down more quickly than forecast. Visco spoke to Bloomberg earlier at the G20 meeting in India. When they end being passed through and they start uh, reflecting the fall in energy prices, then uh, we will certainly see a substantial reduction. This is in our projections. Uh, we project that by the end, uh, the, the ECB projects that by the end of 2025, there will be 2%. My impression is that it might be faster. Meanwhile, another ECB governing council member, Klaus Kanat, told Bloomberg that monetary tightening beyond next week's meeting is anything but guaranteed, suggesting officials could soon pause their unprecedented campaign of interest rates, rate hikes, adding that it was likely we'd get back to 2% by 2024. Let's bring this all now to James Athey, investment director at Aberdeen. James, the net effect of this has just been adding fuel to this global bond market rally that we've been seeing over the past week. Is this more than the U.S., than the U.S. optimism inflation has come in? Do you share that same optimism for European inflation? Hi, yeah, morning, Danny. Essentially, yes. I think, you know, there is a narrative out there that we're seeing a disinflationary trend as a result of the monetary tightening that we've seen from most central banks over the last year. I think the reality is that most of the disinflation that we're seeing is really just the other side of the uh, pandemic and lockdown induced supply shocks, which kind of buffeted the global economy over, over the prior few years. In that respect, it's uh, the other side of, of the sort of transitory inflation narrative. That's, now, that's not to say that central banks were wrong to hike rates. I think by hiking and hiking as aggressively as they have, they have prevented a sort of counter um, counterfactual embedding of inflation. They have prevented a greater degree of second round effects. But largely what we're seeing is just that there was an increase in the price level. And once we got to that new higher level of prices, of course, the rate of change then tends back towards zero. Hmm. The FT ha has a great piece out today talking about this idea of, of this being a Potemkin disinflation narrative. In other words, it's just this facade. It kind of feels like what you're describing to some degree here, James. So if, if again, it's just based on base effects, how do you want to position in this bond market? Is this rally then gone too far? Um, th then it gets into timing. When you, you know, we're talking about a 30 basis point or so rally when the, the sort of two months previously, we'd sold off anywhere between 70 and 150 basis points. You know, looking at the UK, we're still absolutely miles higher in yield terms than, than we were just a few months ago. In that respect, it's difficult to argue that this little rallyette, as we would call it, has gone too far. But of course, the data that we are seeing in front of us today, particularly in the US, I have to say, the European data has definitely been softer, but the US data is showing disinflation without the um, more scary kind of weakening of, of growth dynamics. And that's where this soft landing narrative comes from. So how long we can stay in this holding pattern probably dictates the extent to which you want to be long duration, whether you want to be actually opposing some of the cuts in 2024, whether you want to be in steepness or flatness. The timing is always difficult. We would, we would always believe that you know about these, these events, these triggers, these inflections only in the rearview mirror. They're very difficult to forecast precisely we would look at the balance of risks, the balance of probabilities and say that we expect the disinflation to continue. We expect it to move significantly from headline into the core uh, measures. We're seeing some evidence of that, but we also expect the economy to continue to slow. That informs our, our positive view on government bonds. That's why we like duration. That's why we've been adding duration. And yeah. we do think that the curve will trend steeper at some stage. And James, I think that's a view, at least from an economic perspective, that's shared over at Goldman Sachs. I want to bring our audience the call overnight from Jan Hatz. He's the chief economist there, cutting U.S. recession probability in the next 12 months from 25 percent to 20 percent. The team writes, there are strong fundamental reasons to expect ongoing disinflation. The recent data have reinforced our confidence that bringing inflation down to an acceptable level will not require a recession. James, I want to come back to you because the definition of recession also includes 
to some extent, a wave of layoffs, an increase in unemployment. We haven't yet seen that and therefore have understood that maybe we might not even get there this time, therefore encouraging a soft landing. But how quickly could that change given the labor environment that we're seeing strikes across the United States, strikes across Europe, and really this idea of wages not going up in line with the movement you're seeing in the rest of the economy? How do you think about that, James? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, I would agree that the recession has to be characterized by an increase in unemployment. You know, if you look over multiple cycles over decades and decades and decades, really, the economic cycle is described by changes in unemployment. I, I think where I have a problem really with the soft landing narrative is that it essentially implies finding an equilibrium at a steady rate of unemployment at these lows. And history says that that's actually very difficult to achieve. It, it would be interesting uh, uh, to try and understand whether the soft landing narrative requires the Fed to ease policy back towards neutral in order to maintain, or if indeed R star is much higher and, and rates can be maintained at this higher level. That, that's two very different worlds from a bond market perspective. Um, but my expectation is that we still haven't seen the full effect from much of the Fed's tightening from probably at the second half of last year, at least onwards. And as that increasingly acts as a headwind, along with running out of uh, accumulated savings, along with a precautionary increase in the savings rate, which there was some evidence of in May, as we see these dynamics play out, I do believe that we will begin to see um, you know, jobs growth continue to moderate, but ultimately flip to negative and we'll see an increase in unemployment. Economies you know, display inertia. And so once we start moving in that direction, it does indeed feed off itself until there's a countervailing force. Normally that countervailing force would be a central bank easing policy. So ultimately that would still be my expectation, but I think actually the yield curve can disinvert even if I'm wrong and we find a sort of stable equilibrium at a higher level of rates. You and Jan Hatzius will have a fascinating conversation. I believe he also had thoughts about the term premium there. James Athey walking us through the economics and the trade. Thank you, as always. Coming up on the show, our exclusive interview with the European Commissioner for Financial Services. That coming up next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Danny Berger in London with Kriti Gupta in New York. Let's focus now on financial regulation. Bloomberg's Maria Tadeo joins us in Brussels with the European Commissioner for Financial Services. Maria. Yes, indeed. And it's Mary McGuinness who joins me here in the studio. We wanted to talk about financial regulation. That is a topic that you cover. But you know today in Europe, the big conversation is Russia now pulling out from that green deal what does that tell you and how concerned are you because really? it seems we're not going back to it well let's hope that isn't the case but we're really concerned and i think at this stage to re-weaponize food in a world where there are massive food shortages mm -hmm. and people are going hungry and dying of starvation i think the russian action is reprehensible they need to think again i mean this horrible war is terrible but to add to that then the global impacts on on food security it's just unfathomable that that would happen. What I'm also concerned about as I walk into studio is I hear that there's been some attacks on Odessa. Yes. So not only denying that they will support this uh, you know, release of grain to global markets, but also damaging the very infrastructure that would allow that happen. So this is a very, very serious development. I think Russia must be pressured by everybody to say, stop, are you doing that already? stop, stop. We are. The European Union, how? They know our voice. Mm -hmm. We've been very clear on this. We're doing our own work on solidarity lanes separately to get great. And we will do everything we can. I mean, if this is what Russia is intent on doing, then the, the rest of the world has got to, you know, take action to make sure that we get grain out. We're coming to a harvest is happening. Uh, we know that in some parts of, of the world, the harvest isn't great. We know that global food insecurity is at its worst. So we really have to avoid that there are now horrible spikes in price, which will impact the poorest. And we need to make sure that Russia changes its mind. And Commissioner, let me ask you a follow up question on this, because today the head of the commission said this is entirely cynical because Russia says the terms of the deal have not been met for the Russian side. It's unclear what those terms are or the new ones would be. But if this is a move to have sanctions from the European Union East, is that going to happen? We have been very clear. Our sanctions are there for a purpose. 
they're there to take away money from the war machine that is Russia. The idea that they would bargain yes. with the lives of people in, in places where there is no food at the moment, that is reprehensible and it has got to be called out for what it is. But I would hope, now I hope, that other countries would put pressure on Russia to rethink this. Because if you look at the statistics around global hunger, the disruption of the market we saw after the war was horrendous. Russia tried unsuccessfully to pin that on us, on the Europeans and on our sanctions. But clearly it was a very deliberate tactic of Russia to hold back grain, to stop Ukraine feeding as it does the world. And they're now repeating that attack on, on the hungry of the world. But, but if this is a yes or no question, if this is a way to bargain down sanctions from the European Union, is the answer no? That's not going to happen. These sanctions will not change. That, that is not a just and decent bargain. We cannot deal with people's lives. This should never have happened in the beginning. There should never have been a threat to grain supplies leaving Ukraine. And um, the weaponizing of food, the re-weaponizing of food is just something we cannot but condemn. So we will continue to do our work on sanctions because we believe what Russia has done is illegal. It's against everything we stand for. They have to understand that. But we also are supporting uh, where there is is global um, food insecurity through our solidarity lanes. And we would hope that Russia would see the sense and indeed the awfulness of their current actions and reverse this. I, I see glimmers of hope. Uh, let's see if we do get back uh, to the table. The UN are working really hard on this. Turkey's involved as well. The EU has made its message loud and clear. We cannot allow the world to slip into an even worse food insecurity situation than it is today. And just a final question on this issue, but again, it really is a topic that has eclipsed the conversation today across uh, the European Union. And this has to do now with uh, third party sanctions. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of European taxpayers who say, okay, we sanctioned Russia, we took a massive hit, but what about all of these guys? that continue to trade and they're circumventing sanctions. I mean, that is happening. Do you know who's doing that? How are you going to stop it? Circumvention shows that our sanctions are working, number one. Number two, I think European citizens are not complaining about sanctions, but they want them to be effective and they are. And not others but to clearly, exactly. In times of war, there are people who will do the most awful and they profit from war. We are working forensically to on trade statistics. We're going on country visits. We have mm -hmm. a special envoy who's looking after this. So we are using all of our powers of pressure and persuasion to say you should not be part of continuing and if you do, you get this war. Would you say that? We, there's no point in saying. What we okay. have to say to those countries is recall your own obligation. Do not get involved in something that is, a, you know, a, an affront to um, security and safety of the people of Ukraine. Um, there are those also that we need, to, we need to understand products. So we've got this entire list of products. So while it's not visible, the work we're doing behind the scenes on trade flows, on financial flows, is very forensic, is yielding results, and the pressure will intensify over the coming months because we, we are very um, insistent, and indeed the President, Ursula von der Leyen, has said our sanctions are here to stay and they will be effective much more over time. They are effective now. Russia is trying to circumvent. We're pushing back on that very strongly. And you make that message uh, clear. Now let's go back to your actual uh, portfolio, but obviously uh, this was a the topic and we had to really handle it uh, today. Uh, well, sustainable finance, you said you wanted the European Union to be a champion. There's a review that's happening uh, with ESMA. What can investors expect from it? Because some say, is this going to be a big review, a less review, or are the rules changing every year? Do they get the security they need if you Look, want to get into I, I, space? I think, I think our people who watch what Europe does are very transparent. So what we have are disclosures coming from companies on sustainability, like they, they show profits, they've got to show sustainability data. We're working on those standards. Investors will have access to that information to be able to make informed choices, which is really important. And we have our taxonomy, which is very clear around sustainable investments. We're leading here, but we don't want to lead only. We want others to come with us on this journey. We are looking at ESG ratings. So yes. how are these calculated? At the moment, it's quite opaque. So we're looking for transparency. We're not telling these companies how to do it, but we're asking them and insisting that they tell us show how they actually make these calculations. And then we can see whether they are comparable from one to another. And investors can see what's behind all of this. Really, over the last number of years, what the European Union has been doing, I mean, it's quite extraordinary in many ways because profit is important, but we're now saying it's not the only thing that matters. You also have to have a long-term strategy to address sustainability. Companies know that. Big and small companies know that if they don't change, they do not have a future. We're helping them to go in that direction. And you know the key word? It's not green or brown, it's transition. 
because we have an enormous need for investment in the transition from where companies are today to where they need to be. And just very quickly, we're running out of time, but if you were an investor here, would you say stick with us, the rules are what they are? Or actually, do you get their point that if we're always going to be under surveillance, why should I put my money there? I'm not sure what works now will work in a year. I think they should be very happy that Europe scrutinizes everything, mm -hmm. that we're very transparent, and we're on a journey which is very clear. And it's not just a scheme for five years or three years. It's actually a long-term almost revolution in how we look at business, how we actually behave as consumers, where everything matters. So instead of looking like the blinkers on one direction, we're talking about a circular view of both economies, about companies, and indeed about our own behaviors. This is a moment of enormous transformation. So I think investors will stick with us because there are opportunities. And I think that's important as And you're well. also sticking with your targets on this issue. We are, so, absolutely. So, uh, well, Commissioner, thank you so much. I wish we had an hour, but of course, this is live television, but we'll continue off camera. Thank, thank you so you. much. Always good to see you. Good to see you. And that was Mary McGinnis, of course, Commissioner for Financial Services here in Brussels. Pretty, back to you. Yeah, Maria today in Brussels, they're covering a wide range of topics, specifically top of mind what the implications are of the grain deal that was broken between Russia and Ukraine. Also top of mind here in the U.S., bank regulators set to release plans next week for an overhaul of capital rules that includes requirements for large lenders' residential mortgages to go beyond international standards. For more on this Bloomberg scoop and the latest bank earnings, we're joined by Bloomberg Global Finance correspondent Shanali Basic. Walk us through the implications of the residential mortgages specifically. This is a very targeted area. It is a targeted area and it's a place where you've seen a lot of activity move outside of the regulated financial system since 2008. So what are we looking at? In the scoop broken by Katanga Johnson over in DC for us, the idea here is not only certain residential mortgages, but also certain types of business loans might have higher risk weightings. Right now for a first lien residential mortgage, that looks like around 50%. Now it could move from 40 to 90%. And it is bound to face criticism them, frankly, in the public comment periods after that July 27th release that you'll see from a group of regulators in the United States. Now, this is part of the Basel III endgame, the global international standards. However, the mortgages are expected to be treated more onerously here in the United States, partially to level the playing field. Remember, there's a wider array of banks now about to face more of these international and U.S. standards. And so the idea here is uh, to make sure that these rules are standardized across the board and the biggest banks are paying their due. But again, uh, the criticism here is a lot of this activity has been moving outside of the financial system already and it could constrain lending even more at a time where mortgage rates have been going up as a function of higher interest rates already. All right, yeah, maybe it just moves even more into private players. Um, Shanali, we're also going to get Morgan Stanley and Bank of America earnings out today. What are you looking out for? There's a couple things here. For Morgan Stanley, we're going to keep an eye on that competitive pressure when it comes to investment banking, trading, particularly in the equities business where we've seen them compete very heavily with Goldman Sachs and J.P. Morgan in the last couple of quarters. For Bank of America, it's net interest income. Remember, they haven't given full year guidance yet. We've seen the other big three banks already increase their guidance for the year. So it's going to be interesting to see how the market would take any kind of sense about what they might make this year or even in the coming quarters. And if that will be enough to make the market happy, we'll also be keeping an eye on expenses here. That has been a story consistent across the many banks. Remember, headcount has been kind of volatile across the different banks. We have seen that Citigroup stay stable, but kind of hint that that could be under pressure. We've seen Bank of America make some headcounts. Banks have had some costs tied to severance as well. So that will that be impacting Bank of America uh, in addition to anything else that can kind of erode the bottom line at a time that they're expected to make more net interest income. So those are the big banks. Let's talk about the regionals here as well, uh, or even the smaller banks, PNC Financial, BNY Mellon also coming out. It feels like the kind of banking turmoil of regionals is something we put in the rear view mirror, yet the earnings are going to be highly scrutinized. What are you watching for there? That's exactly right. It's not a question of crashes right now. It's a question of profitability and how much that might erode moving forward as well. What does that look like? Remember, PNC is one of the bigger of the midsize regional banks, if you will. And so the pressure that we're seeing is mostly in the mid to smaller range. So in theory, the U.S. banks, the PNCs could be beneficiaries of some of this 
this both deposit flow as well as lending activity. But remember, lending has been under pressure. The expectation here is the mid and smaller size banks do not fare necessarily as well as the bigger banks that have a different loan mix. And so all in all, the rest of the week is kind of exhausting, Pretty. I mean, it's a, it's a flush of banks. Many are being paid more attention to the other. Tomorrow's Fresh Horizon and Zions, I'd point to those because those are among the worst performers in that KBW Bank Index. So the question is, is the sell-off close to being over? And how long does the overhang last for, if not? Honestly, it's, it's so rude to have all these bank earnings in the middle of the summer where we're supposed to be relaxing. Unforgivable. Um, okay, Shanali, so not a bank, but an asset manager, manager, BlackRock. We had news from them that they would be appointing the Saudi Aramco CEO to their board, which seems like an odd choice given its ESG push. What has BlackRock said about this? Why make the move? Well, it's interesting. You had an email from Larry Fink to Bloomberg just yesterday talking about the unique perspective that they would get from Iran on their board. Remember, interestingly, a lot of large asset managers, BlackRock and its large rivals in the passive world particularly, have making been making a large push internationally. So this does two things. One, it gives them a bigger foothold in the Middle East, large institutional investors. But to the point that you're making, this is the world's biggest oil producer. And BlackRock has come under tremendous pressure from both sides on their ESG policy. On one side, environmentalists are very frustrated that they have not been doing enough when it comes to governance, investing in fossil fuels, when it came to pushing for change in the climate world. And on the other hand, you have another set of pushback from the folks who believe that BlackRock has been too woke in this front. And so to bring uh, here a, a, um, the Saudi Aramco CEO to the board yeah. definitely complicates that story. Yeah, certainly something we're going to be keeping an eye on. Shalini Bassick all over that story. Later today, she sits down with the Morgan Stanley CEO, James Gorman, coming up at 1.30 p.m. New York. Now we've got bank earnings, we've got eco data. Surveillance is up ahead. They're going to walk you through it. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.